because the whole concept of a virus is very bizarre. Can you tell me what what is a virus? A virus is actually not alive. It's a particle of either an RNA or a DNA with a code. It's just a pure piece of a strip of code covered in a envelope. Okay, which is uh, by the way, the envelope is built by the code inside. It cannot replicate on its own. It cannot reproduce. It does not eat anything. It does not poop anything. All it does is it needs to find an something, uh, another host's cell factory so that it could slip in while the factory is running, you know, your own cell producing your own uh, proteins, slip its code in there and make the, the, the cells machinery read the code and make the virus's proteins. Which, and so the virus is not alive. It is just a piece of code gone wild. It, is, it, is no, it does not think of its own. It survives only to maximize its chance of slipping into another host and forcing the host to make its own proteins for it. That seems so bizarre to me that it's not alive, yet it has, like when you, when you, when you think of bacteria, for example, it's living and it, and it reproduces, but how, how can something not be alive yet seek to reproduce purpose. itself? It's just very weird. It doesn't seek. It's just, it's an, it's a name. It's a, it's a function of evolution, right? If it died, <laughs> if, if it had a crappy piece of code or if it's junk code, it's not going to go anywhere, right? Mm -hmm. It's not going to reproduce itself and it's going to die out. So after billions and trillions of copies and billions and trillions of mutations, it's going to tinker its, its, it, itself in a way that is readable by the host cell. And it's going to make, uh, uh, and this readable code is going to make something that will help it survive. Anything that selects for all these things, will therefore live. That is life too. That is also in a, in a way what we do, right? Like think about it, our ancestors till now, we are here because someone gave birth to us. And um, if our ancestor was infertile, um, was castrated in battle, or had some sort of polycystic ovarian syndrome that made their ovaries infertile, we would not be here, right? We are the selective reason for this. And I think the best reason is, look, um, name the vitamin that has caused the most wars and strife in human civilization. Can you name it? The vitamin. Name a vitamin or mineral that has caused more war, strife, um, and human suffering than any other vitamin. I don't know. It's vitamin D. The reason is the reason that Nordic people have lighter skin, Middle Eastern people have medium brown skin, and Africans have dark skin is that the more north you go, the less sunlight you get, direct sunlight. That's why the, it's colder up in the Arctic Circle. But that's also why there are more blonde, fair skinned, light skinned people in Norway, Denmark, and Scotland, and Sweden than there are in Italy, in Turkey, in Greece, or Middle East. <laughs> the reason for that is the dark, the dark skin prevents you from making as much vitamin D. So uh, as these humans have uh, um, left out of Africa, which is, we, can, we know that from DNA, uh, it's, it's in the code, you can't get away from that. And they migrated from the Middle East to, to Italy, to Northern Europe, to the Nordic countries, you're, they had to evolve lighter skin. Mm. And the only reason they did that was so that their skin can continue to make vitamin D from the sun. Mm. Because a dark skin in, in uh, Norway would never make enough vitamin D in, in the Norwegian sunlight. Interesting. Wow. And so in certain ways, we evolved lighter skin and, and everything else from it, racism, all these other kind of things that we identify with our, our, our tribal nature is because we evolved that. 
So the same reason our, we evolved lighter skin in northern latitudes and darker skin at the equator, it is the same driving force because we need vitamin D. And if you don't evolve vitamin, lighter skin in northern latitudes, you will die because mm -hmm. you will not get enough vitamin D, you will die. And over time, you select for only people who have enough light skin mutations that led to their survival in the Nordic countries. So and that, that's the same reason a virus survives, because it just it, it knows nothing but random gibberish of codes. But out of all these random gibberish of mutations, it will select the best thing that will allow it to survive. And that, over time, becomes the perfect virus. Just the total random number generator running random all the time. number generator, but is selected for survival by the forces right. of, around which it lives. But, but where does it come from? How does a virus? Uh, well, how did the first virus come into being? I mean, where, where where do these things come from? What is it? I mean, I just I mean, you said what is it? But like, <laughs> but like, I mean, what? How did it come to be that these things are floating around? That that's that's a really good question. Um, you know, you could ask, also ask, how did we come to being from primordial soup? But it seems it's it seems almost so. It, it, I didn't. So the the origin of the virus is as mysterious as life itself, and it even seems to be almost like an antithesis of uh, life as we know it, almost. But it is part of the world we know it. We are the same evolutionary functions that drove us to be from you know quadrupedal to bipedal because bipedal people can run faster um, 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 uh, these same the forces allow us to survive and I think that is the ultimate evolutionary message you know <laughs>